So when I was younger, I was always very interested in medicine and science specifically. Uh, so one of my fondest memories was working with my grandfather, who was a chemist. And on our property, we had a chemistry lab. Uh, so every single day after school, I would rush off of the school bus, and I would go into this lab, and he would show me, at first, just how to do simple things, because he, he was a winemaker as well. So he, in the very beginning, we'd sit together and we'd make wine, and he'd show me how to take the grapes and use chemistry to turn that grape into something uh, that was much different. Uh, but then as time went on, I started doing my own research, my own work, and looking at how I could change things. And I, really, that piqued my interest in science, where I realized that medicine came from what was very small uh, and, and the, the things that you cannot see. Uh, and I got interested in the way in which we can use science and use chemistry in particular to be able to manipulate those things that we're not able to see with the naked eye. Uh, and also, in the very beginning, I was also very interested in entrepreneurship. Uh, so my grandfather and my father had both started companies, and I always knew that I wanted to start something. I always wanted to build a product uh, that I can get out into the world and that I could make a difference in the medical field. Uh, but really, I didn't know where to start. Uh, so in the beginning, I started doing research. Uh, so when I was in high school, I went to Columbia University, uh, and I was doing tissue engineering research there. Uh, so what we were doing is we were working on a way in which to create a technology that would be able to be injected into the knee to replace cartilage. So a uh, picture if you have osteoarthritis, you wanted something that could go in and replace the cartilage because your body can't produce cartilage on its own. Uh, and, what, and I mean, that was a, a fun summer project that I did for two summers. Uh, but after that, I came back to, to the lab, and I was extremely interested uh, in being able to do my own research. I really wanted to look into a way that I could change uh, the field of medicine by looking into technology. Uh, so I started playing around with really anything that I can get my hands on. Um, and at this point, since I was very young, my grandfather had a very laissez-faire uh, view on chemistry and on me working in the lab. Uh, so in much to the chagrin of my mom, uh, he basically would just tell me, OK, Joe, you can go into the lab, do whatever you want. Uh, so when I was 12, I remember going into the lab and finding some powders, mixing them together, and exploring them into my eyes, and I was blinded for about a day and a half. Uh, after that, my mom told me, you know what, Joe, you're not allowed to work with chemicals anymore. You have to work with plants. Uh, so after that, I, I was a bit discouraged, uh, but I used to go out into the vineyard, and I, I'd go and collect plants. So I, one of my very first projects was actually going out and finding uh, Queen Anne's lace, which is a, a flower, uh, a little white flower that grows in meadows. Uh, and as some of you may know, Queen Anne's lace has salicylic acid in it, which is a precursor to aspirin. Uh, so that, that was one of my very first projects that, that I worked on, was trying to produce aspirin. Uh, but after that, I started working with algae. And with algae, and algae is very interesting, and I, I, as some of you again may know, there's a lot of research going on with algae for biofuel and for ways in which we can use the polymers that exist within algae uh, to do many interesting things. Uh, but what I realized with the algae that I was working with is that if we made an extract, or if I made an extract of that algae, that extract would actually snap back together very quickly. So you had something that was a gel, and then if you interacted with it, it would turn solid very quickly. Um, so the idea that I had was, well, what if you can use that to actually plug up a wound? Uh, so what I was doing was just, it was a very simple idea, uh, but the original idea was to take that product, inject it into a bullet wound, for example, and be able to just staunch the flow of bleeding chemically. Um, and that really got me thinking down the pathway. But as I started working with those polymers, I realized that if you put them onto tissue, if you put them onto skin, you actually got some sort of reaction. And uh, by reaction, I mean that the polymers themselves would change their properties when they came into contact with skin, uh, which really piqued my interest. So I started doing research into, well, what is skin? Uh, so if we look at skin itself, it's not just cells sitting cell to cell, uh, but it's actually this matrix. Uh, so this is a histology slide behind me. So this, this looks at cells. And if you notice, it's not just the cells. There's a lot of stuff that exists around it. Uh, and what we call that is the extracellular matrix. And this ECM, uh, for short, is actually a blend of polymers, of sugars, of proteins that hold the cells in place, tell them what to do and how to behave. Uh, so in reality, we're actually mainly made up of this extracellular matrix. Uh, so to make it in a better analogy, think about the rainforest. Uh, so if you think of the rainforest, you have multiple parts. You have the forest floor, you have the understory, and the canopy. And while all of these are made up of plants, and they're all made up of plants that look pretty similar, each of these sections are home to different 
uh, different animals, and each different animal is in a different environment. Uh, so just in that way, the body itself actually has unique extracellular matrix depending on where it's found. So the ECM in my liver is different than that in my skin, uh, which is different from that in the rest of the body. Uh, so the idea is that if we want to make a technology that actually interacts with the body, we want to make a technology that can replicate or can at least interface with this ECM, uh, because it's not a one-size-fits-all technology. Uh, so now, in fact, if you look at a scar, what a scar is is a body's overreaction to an injury. So what you end up getting is an exaggerated ECM or an ECM that's almost too perfect that is not unique to the area. Uh, so really, a scar is just poorly formed extracellular matrix. Uh, let me see. Uh, so now what's behind me is an animation of the way that cells sit in the extracellular matrix. Uh, so like I said, uh, this ECM houses cells, but any other technology that's on the market is only a 2D approximation or two-dimensional approximation of this matrix, so it doesn't fit. The body doesn't interact with it. So if we want an ideal technology, which is what I found out really early on, is that you want something that can interface with that matrix and actually be able to replicate it. Uh, so now if you look at this, this is an animation of a bleeding wound in the liver. What we discovered, what I stumbled onto, was a material that if you put this onto the wound, it'll instantaneously reassemble into something that isn't exactly the extracellular matrix because it's made out of plants, but it's something the body will see as being very similar to that extracellular matrix. And when that happens, the body will actually be able to form a mechanical barrier against the, floor, the force of bleeding. Uh, so what happens is the body will respond by producing fibrin, which is necessary to stop bleeding. Uh, so this is a, um, a benchtop demo. So this shows a bleed. This is real blood, real meat, uh, at twice human artery pressure. So this is 240 millimeters mercury. This would take five minutes or longer with anything else in the market. Uh, and as you can see, we've already been able to stop it with the material. So again, the material went on. You can see that there's a slight color change, a slight change in shape of the material. And this material will go on and actually form a fibrin patch over the wound, stopping the bleeding. Thank you. So now this technology, I, I found it very early on, but really I found this just as I came to NYU. So the question that I was posed with was, okay, how can I get this to market? Right, I want to start a company around this. I want to make sure that as many people as possible can get this technology. Uh, so the first thing that I knew was, okay, we can stop a bleed with this product. Uh, but I had to identify where the use would be. Uh, and I found out that immediately that there were three markets in which this could be useful. Uh, so the first is the animal health space. Uh, so very early on, I was talking to my family vet, and I realized that veterinarians have a product that was invented back in the 1950s. Uh, so this product takes 10 minutes or longer to stop a bleed, and there's a huge problem with being able to stop bleeds on the liver, the spleen, the kidneys, uh, just because they're very difficult to stop. And you as a pet owner may not notice it, but it's very common that there'll be a bleed that takes a very long time to stop, which can endanger the lives of animals. So vets really need a solution. Now, another indication that I've spoken to in great depth elsewhere is the military, is that if you imagine a soldier being injured on a battlefield, right, that injury is lethal in three minutes or less, and unfortunately what the soldier has in his or her belt takes five minutes or longer to stop. So again, the military was a big indication that we wanted to move into. And then finally, the emergency medical services is really just the domestic front of that. Uh, so if you look at car accidents or you look at any other place where traumatic bleeding can come about, uh, that was another big market that we wanted to go into. And then again, human surgery. Uh, so all of the indications that we see on the animal health side, we found those same indications on the human side as well, which is when you're doing surgery, if you're doing heart surgery, uh, anything from suture line bleeding to trauma to the liver, uh, there really is no good product to be able to stop those bleeds quickly and effectively. Uh, so what we wanted to do is start the company. And again, remember that I was a freshman. I, I was 17 years old, I was at NYU, and I, I really had no idea what I was doing. Uh, but I was walking through the hallways and I, I found a poster that said $75,000 prize 
best business plan idea. And I thought, you know what, I, I should at least try this. I probably won't be successful, but I, I'm going to jump into it head first. Uh, and I ended up meeting uh, a guy by the name of Isaac Miller, uh, who is a, a business student at, at NYU Stern. So that, that's the business school at NYU. And we started the company together. Uh, so we, we just jumped in. Uh, and at the end of the day, we ended up winning this competition. Uh, so we, uh, we, we took second place at the one in the, uh, at the business school and first place at the one back at the engineering school. And we got just enough money to get started. Uh, so this is me uh, when I was and they're 17 or 18, so this picture is about four years old, uh, doing one of, one of the very first demos uh, in front of an audience at NYU. Um, and very quickly after that, you know, we, we brought on a very small team. Uh, so we brought on three more employees. So this is us uh, about three years ago in our, in our first conference. So this was us launching the product, or releasing the, the idea of the product to the animal health market. Uh, this was in San Diego. Uh, and then finally, this is a picture from last summer. So this is a year ago uh, of the team then. Uh, but really, once we got there, we, we ran into this problem, which was that we could show the product work, we could do demos like this, uh, but we really needed discrete data. We needed to be able to prove to the world that this product could actually work, because at the end of the day, we were just a bunch of kids. And from there, we realized that testing is very expensive. Right? It's very difficult to be able to establish a lab and to establish a way in which we can prove that these products worked. Uh, so we also had to figure out funding. So we came right into the middle of one of the, the hardest problems that I've ever had to solve, which was the chicken or the egg problem, which is that you need a lot of money to test a product, but in order to get money, you need to be able to, uh, you need to, be able to have the data in order to convince investors. Uh, so what we ended up doing uh, was really taking a gambit. Uh, at, at the end of 2012, or uh, mid-2013, I had $7,000 in the company's bank account. Uh, and that was either enough money to file patents to make sure the technology would be protected, or to do the testing that we wanted. Uh, and we ended up taking a gambit. We paid for half of both. We did one test, and that one test ended up being successful. Uh, and with that, we were able to raise our very first amount of funding. Uh, and with that, I mean, this is an excerpt from the data that we show. So I mean, I'm not really going to go into it, but the idea is that everything there, so the red line shows how fast blood clots. So, so you take blood, you put it into a machine, and it measures how fast it clots. Red is blood alone, so it takes seven to 10 minutes to make a full clot. And we're over here in blue, uh, which is we do it instantaneously, we'd also do it much stronger. So this graph alone gave us enough money to be able to move into the market. Uh, but then finally we realized, you know, how can we actually get into this market? The, the FDA is this big behemoth that as a young company you look up to and you say, you know, th there's no way in the world that I'm going to be able to get into this market. Uh, and again, we took another gambit. Uh, so I remember I, I was sitting in 2013, I was sitting, it was Christmas Eve, uh, and, and at this time we, we had a team of about six people. Uh, and I just, we, we had rented a warehouse out uh, and we were going to do contract manufacturing. We realized that that manufacturing was not going to work out for some reason or another. Uh, and I, I called up and I, on an impulse, I purchased immediately a giant clean room. I said, you know, what, I'll buy all of the pieces, we'll put it together. And at the end of the day, um, on that one decision, it took us a year to do, we built a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility. Uh, so in that heavily regulated environment, uh, we were able to build an FDA or a manufacturing facility that is to the code of the FDA uh, so that we can make animal health products. Uh, so that allows us to get early revenues so that we can move into the human markets. Uh, so right now we're about a year away from FDA approval, uh, but we're currently launching into the animal health space and we're having very good success with that. Uh, and then the final, pr the final problem that I ran into was really how can you take this college startup and move it into a biomanufacturer, right? Is that if you look at or if you think of a product that's going to be used to save lives one day, you don't think of a bunch of young kids being able to do it. Uh, and really there are three ways in which we had to leverage this. Uh, and we had to make a large change to move from the manufacturer uh, or from, from a bunch of college kids sitting around a table in a dorm room uh, into a world-class manufacturer that can be trusted. Uh, so the first of which was people. Uh, so this was the team a year ago, and right now we have 21 people on staff. Uh, so we had to build up rigorous training and recruitment programs. Uh, so what we did was we made sure that we had industry standard benefits and that all of our staff get trained. So even though we have young staff, I'm my head of quality assurance and regulatory affairs right now is a certified FDA 
an ISO auditor, uh, which is something that he's taking classes with his equivalent in Stryker and Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson. Uh, so we've really been able to build a culture uh, that strives towards excellence and growth uh, without actually having experience in there. And now the next is facilities. Uh, so we were able to, like I said before, build world-class facilities within Brooklyn uh, so that we can make products to the standards that we wanted to be able to do, uh, which is something that I didn't believe that we could do. Uh, but at the end of the day, we really just had to jump into it uh, and take the plunge and learn as we went along. Uh, and then finally, uh, what we had to do was rely on a heavy QMS, uh, which is a quality management system, uh, meaning we needed to make sure that we put in documentation controls uh, so that we could look at all of the ways in which these things are regulated, uh, so that everything from where the raw materials come from to what the release criteria are on the final product, we do that exactly the same way as a large pharmaceutical company, uh, even though we're a small company. Uh, so that allowed us to move forward with this product. Uh, so at the end of the day, and the technology is not only good for hemostasis. Uh, so as I've spoken about, we're trying to move this into as many Part, uh, or as many different niches of the market as possible. And really what I look at is a way in which we can have this technology get into the hands of every soldier, into the purse of every mom, and onto every ambulance. And really have a technology that can, at the end of the day, begin to change wound care. And really, if there's one takeaway from this, it's that you know, at the end of the day, you know, I came very early on into this. Uh, and I was very afraid to go out into the world and be able to just get the resources that I needed. Uh, but really, if, if there is one takeaway, I would say if you want to be able to do something, go out there and ask for it, right? Network, uh, and really the worst answer that you can get is a no. And at the end of the day, every no is just going to make you stronger. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>